All right, CNT 125, Chapter 10. Uh, we're now in the section on attack simulations. So during these risk assessments, during a posture assessment, um, a different, a couple different types of attack simulations might be used to look for risks or vulnerabilities. Um, these would be a vulnerability assessment, pen testing or penetration testing, and red team, blue team. So vulnerability assessment, um, they might use either a, uh, actually you are both, might use both, authenticated and unauthenticated attack. So the idea here is somebody outside the network, what do you have access to? Are you able to, you know, use a telnet port that hasn't been closed and get access to something? Um, the other thing they would do is from the employee standpoint, you know, sitting as an employee, what do you have access to that you shouldn't? So, you know, we'll, we'll pick on Doug Brown. He's able to get to his f folder. You know, he, he uses the, uh, uh, the extra drive, uh, you know, the, the D drive or whatever it is, the network drive. Um, and he has access to his folder, but does he has, ac does he have access to other folders that he shouldn't? Maybe he was on a project a year ago uh, and had access to a certain folder, um, that he should not have access to anymore. So what what does a, a an employee have access to that maybe they shouldn't? So looking at what does a employee have access to or somebody that may be a vendor in the company versus what is an outside user, what could they potentially have access to that is open? The, you know, the telnet port, that sort of thing. Pen testing, um, we're now trying to purposely compromise or get into parts of the network using a variety of tools um, gather information about email addresses uh, are we able to crack any passwords are we able to ma manipulate any kind of wireless transmissions are we able to look for any vulnerabilities um, and using a number of different tools to see what is what is what is available what is not locked down or what is not secured for somebody that they would have potential opportunity to get into parts of your network. So using a number of different tools to do this. Last would be a red team, blue team exercise. Red team, blue team is um, an actual trial of what what is an outside hacker have access to? So the red team is the one that's actually, this would be your like outside vendor, your security assessment team, actually trying to actively get into your network and the blue team is your employees um the the company it security you know literally the the security personnel the other staff in the building responding to these attacks um and this might be a planned time to do this and they might even be calling in asking for people hey you know hey i got locked out of my password can you help me reset it and they're actually trying to hack in and get access to uh, meanwhile, trying to actively scan servers and look for open ports and operating systems that aren't patched and etc. Uh, that would be a red team, blue team exercise. So looking at uh, your, your, your structure as a whole, including your personnel, how are they are responding to these phishing attempts or scanning attempts, etc. Which brings us to some scanning tools. Um, scanning tools can be used to discover a bunch of information. Um, available hosts that you have, um, including information about that host, applications, operating system, versions of things running. Maybe you find an old version of an operating system running that has a known vulnerability. Boom, we're going to target that computer or that system. Um, software configurations. Again, maybe the software configuration is set at the default, which allows blah access through blah port. Okay, and that has not been closed down. Maybe it has the default uh, admin password on. That is a known entity that could be compromised. Um, again, op looking at ports. Is there ports open that shouldn't be? Uh, are there, uh, you know, again, going like Telnet, something like that. Is that port open and allowing that type of traffic through? Uh, placement of and configuration of firewalls. Again, maybe it's a new firewall, but it still has some default settings on. Maybe it's a little older firewall and has not been updated or the op the firmware updated. So there's a known vulnerability in firmware 12.5 or whatever it happens to be. Unencrypted or poorly encrypted data. Um, maybe it is a very basic encryption and a little bit of brute force. You have access to blah folder that now has employee data or uh, customer data or credit cards or that sort of thing. So these kinds of things can be learned through various scanning tools. Um, there's things like Nmap, uh, Nessus, Tenable Nessus, and Metasploit. These are all things that can be used uh, in a variety of different methods to 
learn what's there and now that i know what's there you know maybe i know it's this version of operating system i know that has a vulnerability we're going to attack in this manner uh, these would be scanning tools now hackers use these but flip that around we as employees in the company can use them as well against our own equipment to learn what what does an outside person see um, is there is there ports open that we're not aware of? We're going to do some of this in our security lab. We're purposely going to do some scanning with Nmap. That's the application we have installed, and see what vulnerabilities there might be. Uh, here's just a sample of of Nmap, which you which you get. We're going to be really looking at the ports. What kind of ports are open? Is there anything open that shouldn't be open? Uh, tenable Nessus. Again, you're scanning. There's a number of different tabs here of things you can scan for and look for operating systems on certain programs and operating systems of firewalls and routers and so forth. Uh, here's Metasploit. Here's Metasploit as well. Again, you're getting tabs of information that you're looking through, looking for operating systems and versions of operating systems and so forth. Honeypots and honey nets. Honeypots are a decoy that's purposely, purposely there and purposely vulnerable. Um, and the idea is you're trying to lure a hacker in and kind of watch what they do and learn what they're doing to know, oh, they're trying to get in this way. We're going to make sure we're blocking that, etc. Um, there's actually even security conferences where there is a challenges out there for hackers to hack in. Um, and there's a prize, obviously. But the flip side of it is they're like, okay, you need to show us what you did. And again, the, the security companies are learning from that and trying to share that information uh, uh, to companies of like, hey, look out for this, look out for this. And here are some Honeypot software options that, that, that are out there. KF Sensor, uh, Canary, and Honeybee. These are different ones that are out there that could be used. Physical security. Um, physical security plays a role in all of this as well. Only your trusted IT people should have access to networking closets, server closets, data rooms, etc. Um, so preventative measures should be in place to prevent access as well as detect if access was was granted, um, was it granted to the right person kind of thing. So that brings us to a number of different measures that should be in place in your building. Uh, keypads or cipher locks, some sort of controlled locking mechanism on a door, allowing only the correct person into that area. Access badges. Um, employees usually have a name badge. Um, and a lot of times they can even be uh, a, a swipe type of card that allows them access to a certain part of the building. Um, years ago, lots of buildings used to use keys for people, actual physical keys. Um, many places, those have gone by the wayside in favor of access badges. Um, keys were really hard to keep track of. Somebody can make a copy. Boom, now many people have access to it. Um, and it's really hard to limit now who has access to a part of a building. Access badges have taken the place of many keys because these can literally be turned on for Doug Brown. And when Doug Brown leaves the company, it can be turned off. And whether, you know, whether he has that access badge or not, it's not going to work to get in the building. Think of it almost as like the kind of card you use in a hotel room. Once you check out, if you happen to retain that card, you're not getting in the room. That access has been shut off. That's what a lot of employee badges are now. Some of these are actually proximity type of cards. Uh, the kind of card I have for our, our lab rooms is a proximity type card. I just need to be close to it. I don't have to swipe it. I just need to be close to it, and that will open and unlock the door. Um, again, the nice part about this is it can be programmed that, you know, we'll pick on Doug Brown here. Doug Brown can open lab room 101 and 103, but if he tries to walk down the hall to 104, 106, 108, those are not programmed to open. So Doug Brown has no business opening. It's not going to open. Secondly, these can be programmed to certain days and times. Uh, maybe Doug Brown, and I've done this. I've taught uh, an odd class in Lancaster. Maybe Doug Brown te teaches a class in Lancaster on Wednesdays. Um, so they program it. They, okay, on, on Wednesday, this door in Lancaster, Doug Brown has access to. But if Doug Brown tries to go there on Friday and open that door, it's not going to let me. It's like, what are you doing down here? You don't belong here on a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, you don't belong here, so we're not opening the door for you. All that can be programmed into these access badges. Now, they're not foolproof, but in many cases, they're better than physical keys. That's why a lot of companies use these. 
biometrics can be used in some cases. You know, your fingerprint, uh, your hand, um, even your iris, you know, the, the iris uh, of your eyeball, the, the, the vessel patterns and so forth in your eye can be used to verify it's you that is trying to get into that part of a building instead of just, you know, you borrowed Doug Brown's name badge, if you will. There is um, access control vestibules that can be used in certain locations. Um, years ago, many banks had uh, branches that you would walk in and do banking at. You would go in in person and so forth. Some of the banks I would access had these kind of access control vestibules, uh, a.k.a. called man traps. Um, these were set up that uh, when you open this door, this one would not open no matter what you did. It wasn't until this outer door closed, while it was open, this inner door couldn't be open. Once this outer door closed and latched, then this one would open. When you would try to open this one, this one literally would lock. And the idea there is to try to prevent tailgating. Somebody trying to slide in behind you that should not be there. Uh, banks would use that, that. I commonly encountered that in banks I went to. Uh, but um, certain IT, maybe data centers, uh, might have this installed that you, you open one door, this one locks. Once this outer door closes, then you swipe, and this one opens, but this one locks. That you're not going to let you're not going to let somebody tailgate in through behind you. Locking racks, uh, locking your uh, actually having your equipment racks locked up. So equipment racks can be this style here, where it's just open, open and access to. And as long as that's installed in a locked room, that's okay. But one step better is to literally have your equipment in a cabinet where you lock the cabinet in addition to the room. And here is if somebody gets into the room, you still have this level of security that people aren't going to uh, move cables or plug plug. You know, I think about I think about uh, somebody making a little Raspberry Pi and plugging it in the back of a uh, hiding it in the rack and plugging it into an uh, unused switch port, uh, getting access to things. You know that kind of stuff. So this is going to prevent those types of tampering. Smart lockers. Some of these actually, some of us actually use these to pick up uh, products that we order. Uh, places like Amazon and so forth use this, where uh, when you go up to the locker, you plug in a code or scan a code. It opens door 22. You get it out, and then it closes, and then your code is no longer good anymore. It won't open any door. Um, so this can be used for having equipment sign out, return, etc., in a building or facility. Detection methods. Um, so if I do have security problems, I need to be able to detect that and record that in some manner. And in IT, you might actually be responsible for some of this. So there might be motion detectors. These trigger alarm when uh, uh, motion is activated in an area. And it might even just trigger a camera to start recording in a certain part of an area. It might just control the lights. The lights kick on or shut off. Okay. That could be in there. Uh, the lights in our lab rooms are motion activated. There might be a closed circuit TV. Cameras that are uh, aimed in certain areas, maybe entryways of a building, they're going to record. And these might actually be triggered to motion as well. Once it senses motion, it starts recording and records for X minutes. Um, and these might be scattered around the building and might even be connected into your data network. And again, you might be responsible for maintaining that, not watching the cameras for security purposes, but maintaining the equipment end of it. Tamper detection. You might actually have uh, tags or things on devices or even special security screws on things that people are not able to tamper with, steal, take, etc. Uh, or if you know somebody has monkeyed with it, you, you, it would be obvious that that tag is gone. Um, there's even cameras and things out there that will uh, uh, adjust or, or respond to somebody trying to spray paint or etc. on. You might actually have ASEX tags that you uh, t uh, literally put on devices to maintain where they are. Um, and this could even be as simple as in a hospital knowing where a certain piece of equipment is or in a loading dock moving uh, product through a building. You know, it gets scanned and we can keep track of it as it moves from blah truck to blah truck. And you can keep track of things. It's important to know these are all part of your physical security. These detection methods are part of your physical security in a building.